this this idea of expository apologetics. First, let's define what we're talking about when we say apologetics. Cornelius Van Til gives a, a, a broad definition of apologetics that I find very helpful. He argues that apologetics is the vindication of the Christian philosophy of life against the various forms of the non-Christian philosophy of life. What I really appreciate about this definition is that basically he boils all worldviews in the world down to two worldviews. There's the Christian worldview and the non-Christian worldview. There's various forms of a non-Christian worldview, but ultimately we're dealing with a non-Christian worldview, somebody who's rejecting God's truth. It's also the vindication of Christian philosophy, the, the Christian philosophy of life. It's not necessarily the vindication of me. And, and oftentimes in apologetics, that's what we want to do. I want to vindicate me. I want to get in an argument with you and I want to win. Can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. Apologetics in its simply form is merely knowing what we believe, why we believe it, and being able to communicate that to others effectively. Again, knowing what we believe, why we believe it, and being able to communicate that to others effectively. Essentially is what we're talking about when we talk about apologetics. Um, our, our view of apologetics, we believe that apologetics is for elite Christians. We believe that apologetics requires knowledge of science, philosophy, logic, debate, etc. I believe apologetics requires intimate knowledge of cults and heresies, that it requires an edge of confidence, even arrogance. That's why most of the people who are interested in apologetics are teenage boys. You know, they, they belong to debate clubs and all this sort of thing, and they just want to debate. And we believe apologetics is just all about debate. It's acquire information and argue your side. And it's basically this view that keeps us from doing apologetics. Because your average Christian is not here. Your average Christian doesn't think of, of him or herself as being elite. N doesn't believe, I mean, you can have a degree in, you know, science and philosophy, logic, debate. Well, you can have a degree in one of these things. And still, I know Christian people with degrees in philosophy who just feel like they're just not quite knowledgeable enough for apologetics. Um, that it requires an intimate knowledge of, uh, and familiarity with cults and heresies. You know how many cults and heresies there are? You're wrong. Because even if you had an accurate number when I asked you the question, Somebody just started one and, and, and you didn't add it, okay? And that edge of confidence and arrogance, we'll talk about that momentarily. The biblical case for apologetics. The Bible talks about apologetics throughout. For example, in the, in the plagues, you know, we were, we're preaching through Exodus right now. We've taken a, a bit of a break, a bit of a hiatus to deal with um, the Lord's Supper because now we've come through the plagues, we've come through the last plague, and you know, you get to the last plague, the death of the firstborn and the Passover. Um, and so we're talking about the connection between the Passover and the Lord's Supper. But you, you get to this whole idea of the plagues themselves. And here in Exodus chapter nine and verse 16, God says, but for this purpose, I have raised you up, speaking of Pharaoh, to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. One of the purposes for Israel's time in Egypt, one of the purposes for the plagues, by the way, it did not take 10 plagues. Amen, somebody. It did not take 10. God was not in heaven going, oh, okay, I'm gonna try this now. Oh, he didn't do, okay, I'm going to, you know, he, he, he knew, Pharaoh's going to harden his heart. I'm going to go to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's going to harden his heart. On the last plague, he says, um, this is going to be the last plague. On this plague, he's not just going to let you go, he's going to drive you out. 
could have done that the first time. But he didn't do that the first time. Why? Because part of the purpose was an apologetic purpose. He wanted to demonstrate his superior over, superiority over all of the gods of Egypt. Not just for the Egyptians, and not just for the rest of the watching world, but also for Israel. Because Israel had been there hundreds of years, and he did not want to take them out of Egypt without taking Egypt out of them. And so he engaged in apologetics. Titus 1.9. Apologetics and pastoral ministry. We think oh, only certain people, only certain pastors have to be apologists. Really? Titus 1 9. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and to rebuke those who contradict it. Apologetics is required for every elder. Every elder must be an apologist. If you're not an apologist, you're not qualified for pastoral ministry. I, I don't write the mail. I just deliver it, okay? <laughs> and that's what the book says. You must be able to refute those who contradict sound doctrine. That's apologetics in its simplest form. But also every believer. So for those who say, okay, fine. If you have to, you know, have apologetics in order to be an elder, I'll just leave the eldership. <laughs> you got to leave Jesus. You got to stop being a Christian. 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to everyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. That's every believer. Every believer is commanded to be an apologist. Not just there. In Jude 3, 